If you flip to the end of your Bible, there is this really short book. It's not the last book, but it is the letter Titus. Chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. He loved us. He gave himself for us to redeem us. That's the word we've been studying. To redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify us. Titus 2, 13 and 14. So often I think we come to verses like that and they're, they're incredible, great truths. But we look at it and we think, okay, that must be something that's off in the future. Because you look, you look around now, and you you and I look at ourselves, and I, I, I know I look at my life, and I realize that it's it's not perfect. It's it's not free from every quote lawless deed. It's not pure, completely yet, and we punt that thing off to the future. But but I want you to notice this in in, in this whole talk. This is redemption number five. I'm, I'm Andy Jenkins, and I am talking to you from inside. I have not named this room yet. Uh, if, if you come out here to the hilltop, I've got this room inside the tiny house. It's downstairs, and, and tiny house is really not a tiny house. We just call it the tiny house because um, according to my daughter, Minnie, so that's my youngest daughter, uh, she says, I call it the tiny house because the bedrooms are so small. Meaning the bedrooms in here aren't as big as the master bedroom in the main house. Uh, or another kid calls it the tiny house just because somewhere along the way, Salter did not catch the word small. So things were either, instead of big or small, they were big or tiny. So... Like I have a black SUV and I have what he calls, it's a Volkswagen, the tiny car. Um, that's just how it is. So it's a tiny house because it's smaller than the big house. It is about 1,100 square feet. So it's not like a typical, like you see on HGTV, tiny house. Like it's a legit house with an inside bridge that connects to the other house. Like you, you just, you don't have to go outside. You just kind of walk there. Uh, it, it was this really cool quarantine project that it put together, built it about 95% of it myself. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm in the den of the tiny house about once a month. Third was on the third Thursday. We we're shifting that right now to third Wednesday because one of the kids is playing football and their games are on for junior high Thursday. Wouldn't you know it? So get back to Thursdays at some point. But if, but if you're local, want to come out, we hang out, cook out, talk health, talk about healing, hope, some, some of those things once a month, just the hangout. That happens third Thursday. Just send me a PM or a DM and I'll give you the information. And, and really, even if you don't know us, you you can come. You, you can show up. We'll figure it out. All right. For the last couple of weeks, I, I've been talking here and this concept of redemption and the concept of life, true life, abundant life, starting now. I'll, I'll circle back to this first. I almost kind of opened up the podcast with this one. G Jesus says, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I've come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. And, and that life he was talking about, it, it was he was talking about, he's juxtaposing that the thief steals, kills, destroys now. And he's, he's come to give you a better way of life in the now, not a better way of life in the future. Not, not like this life is just going to be one long meat grinder of a lifetime. Oh, and then when you die, you'll get to go to heaven. Now, let's, let's be real. I, I've told you, I've, I've been through, uh, goodness, back, back in like 2016, I told everyone the next year, 17. I said that that was a meat grinder of a year. I actually used that term, meat grinder of a year. Don't want to repeat that again. And 17 was pretty good. And then 18, oh my gosh, if you thought 16 was bad, it was like 17 was just think back to that game show, no whammies, no whammies. Imagine if you get every whammy at one shot. Talk about the thief killing, stealing, destroying. 
And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've you've been through that, uh, your own version of some kind of oh, surely there's there's more to, to life than this. When Jesus said, "I've come that you might have life more abundantly," he surely didn't mean this or the verse that I opened up with a moment ago, Titus 2.13. He he loved us. He gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, to purify us. Oh, is is this that? And there is that tension that we talk about so often that life is beautiful, but life is, it's, it's messy. It's hard. It's beautiful. It's tough. It's beautiful. It's chaos. It's beautiful. It is sometimes the most frustrating experience you'll ever have. But but there's this. We still contend for what is laid out in Scripture as uh, our blessed hope. We still contend for uh, what's offered as the Lord's best, no, knowing that sometimes we don't see that perfection and we won't we won't see it all uh, until at some point in the future, but we still hold out that hope and walk towards that in in this moment. The model for redemption that we see, and redemption is that word that we said means freedom in, in every area of life. The model that we see, it actually is found in the book of Exodus. And so when we talk about Jesus being our redeemer, Jesus loved us, he gave himself to redeem us. That word redemption it looks back at the Exodus story that it's it's what scholars call the law of first mention that to understand a concept in scripture we look back to the first time that the word was mentioned in scripture and we see how it was used there well the first time that was redemption was used in the scripture it's talking about that redemption that freedom story of the children of Israel from the Egyptian dynasty they're given their freedom and the freedom God gifted Moses and the children of Israel with that paradigm it helps us understand a better picture of what Jesus does for us and the redemption he offers us by his blood. Now, here's another layer I want to add to that. It was a real world in this life, not perfect, but in this life redemption. And and when we get to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews actually says this. Hebrews 8.6 says this. And Hebrews 3, 1 through 6 says very much the same thing, that Jesus's ministry is far superior to Moses's. So instead of expecting less from the redemption of Jesus, and instead of spiritualizing that and say, well, you know, it's not really the same. It's more important, like what happens when we die. We should expect more now in this life than less. In other words, like let's let's flesh this out. If what Hebrews said is true, that the new covenant is superior to the old, if that's true, then if the Exodus story includes physical healing, then the cross includes that and more. If the Exodus story includes emotional health and wholeness, including freedom from guilt and shame, condemnation, curse, then the cross includes that and more. If the Exodus story includes abundance and provision, then the cross, it it includes that and more. If the Exodus story includes freedom of the will and self-determination, if the Exodus story includes this blessing of the work that you put your hands to and this blessing of everywhere you walk is blessed, if the Exodus story includes those things, the cross, it includes that and more. And why? It's because it's based on a better covenant with superior promises. That's what Hebrews 8, 6 says. So let me wrap around to some things I've kind of already said. And let's see if we can put some pieces together. If if you're just now joining me, you you might want to go to talk number two about judgment. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Talk number two from the redemption series. 
In the Exodus story from Egypt, physical slavery, the focal point of that entire story was the Passover lamb. Uh, it, at least when you get to Exodus chapter 12 and you're starting to walk in freedom. More, more specifically, it was even this. It was the blood of the lamb being placed on the doorpost. If that blood was on the door casings, then the angel would just pass over the home. That's where the name comes from. If not, the firstborn male of both people and animals would, would be killed. Do you see that in Exodus 12.12? 12? Now, I want you to notice again what I've said before, that a person's gifts and skills, that a person's personality, their past, their family situation, their health, their living situation, their age, none of those factors mattered. The angel did not look at personal qualifications or a lack of personal qualifications. The angel looked for the blood. You, you could even say this. The angel didn't even look at two things I talked about in the previous episode. The angel didn't even look at their faith quotient or their level of obedience. Now, that smacks against so much of what we would teach in the Western church on Sunday morning. But if we're just going to go by the Bible and just going to go by like, here's what it says. If the blood was present, that was enough. If, if the blood was present, freedom was was coming, and freedom was coming to be experienced, not in the future. Freedom was coming to be experienced that very day. Now, I want you to remember the connection. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Or just remember everything about that Exodus story, and then just personalize it to you. Christ, your Passover lamb was sacrificed and offered his blood for you, okay? Your gifts and skills, your past, your personality, your family situation, your living space, your health, your age, none of those factors matter. Not even your faith quotient or your current level of obedience. If the blood is present You know that Christ loves you, he's for you, and freedom is coming, and freedom is now. Too often, Christians, Bible people, limit the effects of Jesus' blood to the afterlife, to what happens uh, when, when we die. But The biblical thrust is that the blood changes life now, in in the present, just as it did for the children of Israel who walked through the Exodus. So maybe the takeaway right here is that we need to figure out how do we apply that blood? How, how How do you metaphorically put it over the doorpost? Like we, we don't want to simply see it as a way to make it into heaven. We want to see it as a means to walk out the door of our house right now. And when we walk out of that door, we're walking into this space of freedom. See, too often we adjust our lives around the problems that you and I face. We feel bondage. We have chains. We exhibit mindsets. But we're invited to overcome those now in the present. Okay, redemption in Exodus, it didn't just give the children of Israel hope for their future. It gave them a hope, not after they die, but in the moment. And, and in fact, here's what's interesting. All throughout Scripture, every biblical author that even refers to that story refers back. They look back and, and say, hey, redemption happened, and they are now free, and things are now different in this current life, even generations later, because of what happened there. So like in Deuteronomy 7, 8, Moses reminds that the Lord loved his people so deeply that he redeemed them. Uh, In Deuteronomy 15, 15, he reminds them that they were once enslaved, but now they're not. They're not in bondage. The Lord redeemed them. In 2 Samuel, so generations later, David even asked the question just as he bursts forth with this, this spontaneous worship when he's returning the Ark of the Covenant to Israel, the Philistines had had it. He says, who's like our God? He he redeemed his people and he made a nation. 
And he's, he's saying like, hey, we're all here and things have changed in this life for generations because something changed in life for them. Isaiah, he prophesied that God made a path for the redeemed people to walk, like a path to move forward. He, he didn't just redeem, put them on pause until death. He redeemed and then led them to something. And, and this is something you see over and over throughout the Bible. In fact, here's where it gets really incredibly interesting for me is when you when you get to the New Testament church so by the time that Paul and uh, the others are writing post resurrection post redemption that was provided by Jesus okay the Exodus model was really pointing to what Jesus applied to us for all of life so by the time Paul and the apostles and everyone else is kind of bursting on the scene in the early church are writing here's here's what was super interesting that church that they were leading, it often focused on the here and now, present life so much, just like their ancestors of faith did in the story of Exodus, that Paul had to go out of his way to emphasize to that church that it was not only in this life that they had hope. It was not only about now. Now, do you see the oddity of that? Because we're often punting off to the future. And Paul was saying, like, it's not just a current hope. It's also a future hope. He's, he's saying, you also have hope for the future. He's, he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. Okay, we, we, we tend to, to be clear, we tend to reverse that and we place our hope in the future only simply being content to endure the present now as best as we can. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, he discusses the resurrection of Jesus in detail. Okay, remember, it's the cross and the events surrounding the cross when Jesus bleeds, which is where our redemption happens, redeemed by the blood. So some of the members at Corinth uh, were starting to argue that there was no resurrection. Uh, not a resurrection for Jesus uh, not a resurrection for people who had already died, which one of the tenets of the Christian faith is Jesus rose from the dead. In the future, all of us will get up out of our graves and rise also if we're dead before Christ returns. So their, their, their way of thinking was this life is it. And, and they weren't trying to be like hellions or saying, well, there is no future, so just live like hell now. Like they, no, they like thought they had a hope right now. But... They also thought when you die, it's just over. You're finished. So Paul writes 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection, and he says two things to them in response to that line of thinking. First of all, he provides them with proof that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, the proof is this. The proof is over 500 people saw Jesus after his resurrection, saw him alive. They saw him at separate times. They saw him together. They ate meals with him. They saw him in groups. So it wasn't just, you know, random, oh, I think I saw him. Oh, I think, like, there were people that were still alive that Paul said, hey, you, you can go talk to these people. You can go see them, and they're there. There are eyewitnesses that some of them are your neighbors. Some of them are your friends. Some of them are church leaders that live down the street. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. The second thing that Paul says is this. He reminds them that your current situation in this life is radically bleak if Jesus did not rise from the dead. He gives them a couple of points. He says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, your faith, it's pointless. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. He says in verse 15, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then I'm basically a false teacher, is what he says. Because I've been teaching you for years that Jesus rose. So if Jesus didn't rise, I've got it all wrong. Third point, he says, is if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then you're still in sin because it's Jesus' new life. It's his resurrection that supposedly grants you freedom from sin. Wages of sin is death. He rose as a new person. You now live as a new person 
living in the redemption and the freedom that he's offered. So in the end, Paul Paul concludes this. This is, this is a powerful statement. This is kind of his summary in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If only in this life we have hope, we're to be pitied more than all men. Uh, so if, if only now in this hope we have, if only now in this life we have hope, we're to be pitied above, you just insert the worst situation that you could find yourself in. In other words, here's, here's what I want you to see. Gra- grab hold of this. The believers in Corinth, they had this robust faith that the benefits of Jesus were for this life now. That redemption brought healing now. That redemption brought the way of thinking and changing your will now. That redemption brought the blessing of your hands and your work now. That redemption brought the blessing of where your feet travel Now, that redemption brought emotional wholeness and joy and passion and purpose. Now, that redemption redeemed your work. Now, but they had poor theology about what happens after you die. So, Paul corrected that and he said that Jesus' death and your redemption they profoundly changed something in the present. But it also changes the future. Now, here's here's what I want you to see about that. Here's what I want you to apply. Paul reminds them, and he would say to us, you don't have to pick and choose. You don't have to decide if the benefits of the Christian faith, if the benefits of redemption are present now or if they're future then. They're both. You, You get both. And like I would say, the author of Hebrews says, hey, if if the old covenant changed life now in the present, like it did for the children of Israel, then the new covenant is based on better promises. It changes life now in the present too because it's better. It doesn't only change the future and heaven, it changes now. And so he would say, don't spiritualize the benefits of Christ. Don't Don't say, well, the greatest work that Jesus does isn't that he heals the body, but it's that he heals the soul. I've I've heard that. I've probably even said that. Don't futurize the benefits. Don't just say something, well, this is just my lot in life. I'll always struggle. Kind of like with this Eeyore voice, if you remember Winnie the Pooh. And, And don't just drudge and say, It'll be fixed in heaven. It will be. And this life and and this world will never be perfect. Yet at the same time, the invitation is to experience some glimpse of the presence of the future now. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12 says that Jesus obtained for us an eternal redemption, an eternal, not just a future, but an eternal one that knows no bounds. Eternity isn't just the present keeps on going. The, the eternity is, it, it reaches out from the future into where we are and even backwards from where we are. Like there is this restoration even of, of your past, this redemption of your past. Redemption shoots out in both directions, meaning the call is for you to experience something different in this moment. I'm going to put a chart in the show notes. Just go go to the website, follow the link. I'm going to put a chart with all kinds of verses and scriptures where you can compare Exodus and compare this verse that David puts out and these verses that talk about redemption. You see, during the Exodus, the Israelites, they they didn't wait to die to experience freedom. They walked it during their lifetime. That that's why I think that story is so profound. It's it's why it's so important. It's not just this Bible metaphor that like raises this great faith in us that oh Jesus did something in the past or you know it it, it is it is the story. It is the image. It is the parallel of what 
we're to experience. So when you, re- you roll into the New Testament and you read things like Luke 1, 68, and Zechariah prophesies that the Lord has blessed his people and that he is sending redemption. Or Luke 2, 38, when Anna bears witness to everyone who's there walking into the temple that day when Jesus is brought in on the eighth day to be consecrated, that redemption is here. Or, or in Romans 3, 21, when Paul says that we're justified by grace through redemption that's in Jesus, through through the process of freedom that's there. Or in 1 Corinthians 1.30, when, when Paul writes that Christ became for each of us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, freedom. Galatians 3.13 talks about you and I being redeemed from the curse. In Galatians 4, 4 through 5, that God sent his son to not only redeem us from the curse of the law, but to redeem us to adoption as sons, as daughters. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption, freedom through his blood. The verse that we began this talk with, Titus 2, 13 and 14, he loved us. He gave himself for us to, here's our word, redeem us from every lawless deed to purify us. And then at Hebrews 9, 11 through 12, with his blood, we have eternal. It moves out in both directions, past, redeemed, present, redeemed, future, redeemed. When we read verses like this, it, it means that we shouldn't tolerate a lot of the things in the life that we were never intended to just accept as the norm. That, 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 we, we shouldn't feel entitled. At the same time, there should be this humble confidence, this, this boldness to approach the throne of grace because redemption has been provided for uh, moving beyond double-mindedness and wavering. That redemption has been provided to move beyond shame, condemnation, guilt. That redemption has been provided to move beyond sickness and disease. Redemption has been provided to move beyond poverty, lack. Redemption has been provided to move beyond a lack of purpose, a lack of direction. Redemption has been provided to move beyond this inner struggle, this inner turmoil. Remember, Jesus told us that the thief comes to steal, kill, to destroy. He promises that he came to give you, to give me life more abundantly. And it seems odd that that we would uh, even theologically crusade or argue for our right to experience the very things that Scripture says the thief brings, the killing, the stealing, the destroying, when life now, in the present, is here for us to imperfectly yet wholly contend for do you see my prayer is that the lord would bless you that he would keep you that he would be gracious and shine his face of favor upon you and may you see and experience that the new covenant to which you've been invited, the redemption of Jesus is based on better promises than the redemption of Moses. And so may you experience not less, but more. And even in these times where it's uncertain, even in the places where there doesn't seem to be a freedom, may you see the eternal redemption break forth now without spiritualizing the promises without futurizing and punting them off to the future but imperfectly contending for the perfect grace peace i'll see you next time